Good evening, everyone. I am uh, James. I'm, I have the privilege of pastoring here at Redemption Heights and, uh, and the extra special privilege of teaching tonight uh, to you all. If this is your first time here, I am so excited that you could join us for worship. Uh, this is always the highlight of my week, and not just because it's my job to be here, but because I genuinely love gathering with the body of Christ uh, to worship our good, good Savior. Uh, I, I really love being able to sing uh, that song, that second to last song, more than enough that, that Michael and Mark led for us. Uh, that's a song I'm pretty sure I've been singing since I was like five years old at church stuff. Uh, and it's still, it's still so true. It is, it's a timeless truth. Uh, that's the beauty of some of the commands of God. One of the verses that Kathleen read talked about how we should sing to each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And and it's so beautiful when we get to follow the commands of God and see so quickly how they're good for us, right? How like when we do what God says, that actually ends up being exactly what we need. Uh, you know, in this small example of songs that remind us of his goodness, but in everything in life, when we follow his commands, it ends up leading us exactly where we need to go. Now that has nothing to do with my sermon tonight, but if you give a pastor a microphone, he's going to talk about whatever, so... <laughs> Uh, tonight, we're going to be in Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21. We are in a series about, uh, called Who is Jesus, where we're looking, going through these, this section of Matthew, looking at who the identity of Christ is through his interactions with the different people, the different miracles he performs. Like last week, we talked about who is Jesus, and Pastor Mark preached a sermon on the execution of John the Baptist and how Herod, the, the ruler at that time, thought that Jesus was this resurrected prophet who was coming to ruin his good time. Oh. But this week, we'll be talking about who Jesus is as a satisfying Savior. We'll talk, him, talk about who he is as the Savior who satisfies. And we'll be looking at one of the more famous miracles uh, in the Bible. In fact, it's the only miracle that is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. You know, there are a lot of stories that overlap, but this particular one is in all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as we begin to, to look at this, I had a question for you, something for you to consider. And that is, what is the best meal that you have ever had? What's the best meal that you've ever had? When I think back through my memory of all the best meals I've ever had, uh, thankfully none of them have been on my own dime, right? None of them have been meals that I have paid for. If you asked me to pick a restaurant, I'd say let's go to Taco Bell, if that shows you my culinary palate. Uh, but, but, but many of the best meals I've had were when I was in college. You see, I had a best friend. I have a best friend from college who is a foodie. He loves fine dining. He makes all these delicious meals himself, and he would go to all these nice restaurants, and he didn't like to eat alone. And so when he would go to a nice restaurant, and, he, and if he didn't have a special lady to take with him to that restaurant, I would get tagged in, and he would treat me. Uh, or when his parents were in town, and they took him out to eat, they'd bring me along. And so I got to eat all of these delicious meals at all of these nice restaurants because of my friend. And this one time we went to this place called Opus 9. If you've ever been to Williamsburg, Virginia, you may have heard of Opus 9. It's like the nicest steakhouse in this uh, touristy area. So it's, it's good food. And it was way too pricey for me normally, but my friend's parents were treated. And so I had this delicious steak. It was cooked. It was cooked rare, you know, as a steak should be. And it was delicious, covered with this like thick cream sauce and crab. Like, like crab meat just sprinkled on top. And it was like hands down the best meal I've ever had. I still think about it sometimes. It was delicious. His parents dropped some serious change on that meal for all of us to have this steak. And it was so good. But the next morning I, I woke up and I was hungry again. Right? The I had the greatest meal of my life, the best food I'd ever tasted. And I woke up and I was hungry. 
Maybe you've had this same experience. Maybe you've experienced something phenomenal, something incredible, something you thought could never be topped, and it satisfied you for a little while. But then eventually, you're hungry again. You're ready for the next meal. You're ready for the next experience, the next high. Whatever it is that you thought you needed, it it really didn't satisfy you. And you might be thinking, James, you're expecting too much of food. You're expecting too much of even a fancy steak. And you'd be right. But, but don't we all do that? Don't we all expect too much from the experiences we have in life? We expect too much from our family, from our relationships, from our work, from our entertainment, from our political leaders. We expect them to satisfy a longing deep inside of us. Well, tonight we'll be looking at a story about a crowd seeking satisfaction. It's the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 from Matthew 14. And I hope we get to see who Jesus is through this story. Because I think that Jesus is the one person who truly satisfies. He's that one thing that we have been truly looking for. So if you guys would join with me in your Bibles to Matthew 14, verses uh, 12. Sorry. No, sorry, verses 13 to 21. Uh, it'll be on the screen behind me as well. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard, heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages to buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 besides women and children. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that tonight as we come before you, as we come before you to, to study your word, to hear what you would have to say to us, I pray that our hearts would be open, that our ears would be listening, that we would be prepared to receive your word. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be at work here tonight. Lord, nothing I can do or say can bring life to the, death, to the dead. Nothing I can do or say can work miracles. But God, you are a miracle worker, and you are still working here today. So I pray that tonight you would work in our hearts so that we could see you clearly. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. So tonight the plan, just to kind of outline what this evening will look like from my perspective, is I want to talk a little bit about the story, kind of break down what specifically happened in this encounter, and then talk a little bit about what that means for us, and then talk a little bit about what it reveals about Jesus. And then I'll send you all home. So get ready, strap in. That's what's coming your way. And the first thing I think that we see as we begin to walk through the story is that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He's the God of the Old Testament. He is Yahweh, to use the name of God from the Old Testament. And then when I say that, I want to be clear. I'm, I'm saying that not only is he divine, but he is specifically the God of Israel. And I think often we kind of conceive of Jesus as coming into existence with no prior history or patterns of behavior or established character or anything like that. But, but the truth of Scripture is that Jesus is the same God in the New Testament that he was in the Old. His actions fit into a pattern of behavior. He has a unique and special history with the people of Israel. He has a pattern of mercy and justice, of faithfulness to his people, of a heart for the nations. The Jesus we see in the New Testament isn't a departure from God's character. It's a continuation of who he has always been. And that's why we can't just, as, as one pastor put it, unhitch from the Old Testament. 
right? As, as believers today, we can't stop reading the Old Testament, even if it might seem culturally different or distant. We still need to read it because it is the same story of the same God who made five loaves feed 5,000. That is Jesus. He's the God of the Old Testament. And if we want to know who Jesus is, we need to see what he's revealed in all of Scripture. And I think this miracle particularly shows us that Jesus is the same God as that of the Old Testament. We see the same character. You know, for one, we see that he sees with compassion. We see that he's followed by needy people. And we see that he provides for his followers. In verses 13 to 14, we see clearly that Jesus sees with compassion. Verses 13 and 14 say this, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there on a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. See, after hearing of the death of John the Baptist, like we talked about last Sunday, Jesus withdrew to a desolate place. He was trying to get some alone time. But when the crowds heard that where, that's where he was going, they followed him on foot from their towns so that they could see Jesus. And now, if, if this was me, if I had just had a hard day or if I was trying to get some alone time, I love, I love alone time. It's wonderful. If I was trying to get some alone time and the crowds came to me, I think I would be irritated, right? Like how many of us at the end of a long day, especially if we have children, at the end of a long day have thought, man, I just wish that you didn't come to me with your problems. I don't want that text message about an emergency. I don't want that phone call. I don't want that reminder that I need to vote in a couple of weeks. Like we get it. It's happening. Just leave me alone. But that's not how Jesus was. He saw the crowd, and he was moved by compassion to show them mercy. And that's what we see about God throughout the Bible, right? In Exodus chapter 2, in the very beginning of the book of Exodus, there's this description of the suffering of the Israelites and their captivity in Egypt. And verses 24 to 25 say this, And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. And that introduction, that description precedes all of the miracles he worked in rescuing his people from captivity to Egypt and delivering them to the promised land. You know, we see this similar encounter in the story of Hagar, who was the maidservant of Sarah, Abraham's wife, and there was a whole bunch of shenanigans that went down where Sarah, doubting that God would keep his promise to give her a son, decided that he should just, she should take matters into her own hand and have Abraham knock up her maid. And then she wasn't happy with it after it happened. And, and all of this just goes to show that, right, making bad decisions leads to bad consequences. But Hagar eventually was chased out of her home by Sarah. She was forced to leave. But God— who is faithful, who sees with compassion, saved her. And she actually gives God a name after he rescues her from the wilderness she was wandering in. This is what it says in Genesis 6, 13. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Right? The character of God, the history of God, is that he sees suffering people, and is moved by compassion to acts of mercy. So when we see Jesus do this here in Matthew, it's not a new thing. This is who God has always been. A sacrificial God who gives up, who's inconvenienced, who gives up, gives up his own desires, his own comfort to help others. And this is how God sees us today. He still sees us with compassion. He knows the situation that you're facing. He knows the suffering that you're in, and he sees you with compassion. And he still delights in showing mercy. He still delights in rescuing his people. And to speak of the people of God, we also see in this story that Jesus is followed by needy 
people. We see this especially in verses 15 to 17. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place. The day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. You see, Jesus was followed by a needy crowd into the wilderness. That word desolate that we see twice in this passage is the same Greek word used in the Greek Old Testament to describe the wilderness that the Israelites wandered in after they followed God out of Egypt. When I was in the eighth grade, I went to a tiny Christian school, and so we got to do stuff that I'm assuming is illegal at public school. I'm assuming. Well, one of this was an eighth grade backpacking trip. We went into just the mountains, into the wilderness with just our eighth grade teachers and like 30 middle schoolers with backpacks full of everything they would need to survive. We took all of our food and water. They didn't even let us take tents. We had to like, we had to take tarp and rope. I'm not, an, I'm not outdoorsy. I hated it. It was a terrible experience. Uh, it was not character building. It was just demoralizing. It rained the whole time. But we took this like short trip into the mountains, and yet we prepared like we were Navy SEALs being deployed. Like it was, it was crazy how much preparation we did. These crowds, on the other hand, just followed Jesus out into the wilderness. They didn't even like pack a lunch. They just went out to follow Jesus. You know, that's a, a great display of faith in Jesus. Because there are two options. Either they were trusting Jesus to provide, or they saw him as more important than their physical needs being met. Right? Either the crowd assumed that he would do some kind of miraculous provision for them, or they thought, I would rather be hungry and hear Jesus than have a full meal at my home. Both of these options show how important they thought Jesus was. And this is a great example of childlike faith, right? The Bible talks about childlike faith, how we should come to God as a child. In fact, it says that in, in Matthew 18, 3. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. To enter the kingdom of heaven, we have to have the faith of a child. Now, I don't know if you know a lot of children, but they're not typically the best planners. I like... I've, I've begun to hang out with more children now as my friends begin to have kids. I'm even being invited to kids' birthday parties again, which is a surprise to me. I didn't realize that was a part of growing up. Uh, but something I've noticed is that kids almost always have snacks, but they never pack them for themselves, right? Like, they never think, I might get hungry later. I should grab a pouch or, or whatever. Like, they have someone else do that for them. Their parents provide them. A, a lot of being a child is just trusting that your needs will be met by your parents. Like, I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I left my house without my wallet and didn't have a little bit of like a, oh no, what if I need to buy something? But kids leave the house without their wallets all the time. They just trust that wherever they go, they will be provided for. And that's, that's the childlike faith that this crowd displayed in Jesus. They trusted that if they just followed him into the wilderness, he would provide for them, or they would have something better than the food they could have had at home. See, this is a great picture of faith because they've put themselves in a position where God will provide or they are going without. Right? That's a good picture of faith, a place where either God provides or I don't have. And, and listen, I'm not saying that you should call poor planning, trust in God's providence, right? You shouldn't be like, I'm not going to pay these bills, but God's still going to provide. That's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that faith is living out of the confidence that if God calls you somewhere, he will provide what you need when you get there. Right? This is what we saw with the example of Abraham in the Old Testament, that God called him out of his home, out of Ur, to a promised place where he would become a nation— and he went and obeyed God just on the promise of God's word. He had faith that if God said he would do it, he would do it. So he went to where only God could provide. And that's the character we see 
of God in the Old Testament, right? We see him consistently being followed by people who are desperate in need of him, who have no other option, no other recourse, no other source of strength, right? Jesus wasn't followed into the wilderness by the best or the brightest, by the most powerful or wealthy, by those who had everything going right for them. It's the needy who followed Jesus, the weak, the humble. And that same is true today of the people of God. So Jesus was followed by needy people. We also see that Jesus provides for his followers. Here's the part where we get to the, the exciting part, the miracle. This, let's look at verses 18 to 21. And he said to them, and he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. So here we see Jesus provide for the crowds, provide for those needy people who followed him. He provides for five thousand people with five loaves and two fish, or sorry, five fish, no, five loaves and two fish. I got it right the first time. I don't know exactly how many fish make a meal. I'm not a big pescatarian, but that's not enough for 5,000 people. And it was more than 5,000, right? It was 5,000 plus the women and children. It was 5,000 men and women and children. It was a massive crowd, and yet Jesus miraculously feeds all of them to the point that they were satisfied. And if you are a student of the Old Testament, here your, your ears might perk up. You might notice that this is similar to some other stories. You know, the one that jumps out first to me is the story of God providing the manna in the wilderness for the people of Israel. When the Israelites followed God into the wilderness, they didn't bring enough food for the whole trip. Right? They packed some food, but they quickly ate all of their supplies. And so they, like they tended to, began to grumble. They began to complain because they didn't have food. But God miraculously delivered bread for them. He would make bread appear from heaven every morning and quail appear at the evenings for them to hunt and eat. God cared for his people. He provided for them miraculously when they followed him to a place where they had no other option. You see, this miracle shows that Jesus is the God who provides for his people. It's a display of his incredible power. Only God can feed 5,000 with five loaves. That's something that only Jesus can do. He can create something from nothing. This shows that he is God. It is only God who can do this. But it's also a display of his character. You see, God sees us with compassion and is moved to show mercy. He saw their hunger. This wasn't a, a critical need. They could have gone without food for a night. But God saw their hunger. Jesus saw their hunger, and he fed them. This mix of power and compassion shows that Jesus is God. And not just any God, but the God of the Old Testament. He is Yahweh. He is I am that I am. He's the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the God who redeemed his people from exile and delivered them to the promised land, who rescued them from the nations, who preserved them through judgment to be a people of his own possession. The God who is a refuge to his people and who shows mercy to all who draw near to him in faith. That's who Jesus is. That's who he has always been. That's who he is today. And, and this matters. This is important for us to realize, and, and here's why. Because Jesus is worthy of our total trust. We should trust him enough to follow him into the wilderness. How many of us are hedging our bets when it comes to trusting Jesus. Hey, we'll, we'll call him Lord on Sundays, but start packing our own lunch just in case he doesn't come through. We'll start, we'll dip our feet in the pool of faith, but not really commit. 
right? How often do we hold back from sharing our faith because we want to follow Jesus, but we don't trust him with our reputation, or we don't want to know what would happen if we shared our faith with a coworker and we got made fun of. Or maybe we're stuck in a bad relationship and we know better than to be in it, but we don't want to trust God with our love life. Or maybe we feel called to give more generously to the church, but we don't want to trust God with our finances. We'll claim that he's a good father, but we'll make backup plans just in case he doesn't come through. We treat God like he's not compassionate. We treat God like he's not capable of caring, and we hold back, we hedge our bets, we don't really trust Jesus. You see, we think that we need food. We think that we need relationships. We think we need fat bank accounts, healthy families, a functioning democracy, and a tax-free status for our churches. We think that those things are what we need to survive, and so we compromise. We hold on to our backup plans, and we keep eating bread that leaves us hungry the next morning. This never gives life. Do you guys like chewing gum? You know, it's nice if you need to freshen up your breath. I think four out of five dentists recommend it. I've had hubba bubba. I think those are really just pink rocks, but they say it's chewing gum. Well, the, the problem with chewing gum is that if you're hungry and you put in a stick of gum, you'll chew it for a little while. Like, it'll, it'll start, you, you'll start to think that you're eating, but you'll never be full. It will never actually satisfy. And this is the situation that we often find ourselves in with these things we think will satisfy, these things we place our trust in that aren't Jesus. Jesus is worthy of foolish, childlike faith. He sees us with compassion so we can trust him to care for us. He's capable of miracles so we can trust him to act on our behalf. We can follow him into the wilderness because he will provide for all our needs. So where is Jesus calling you to go? Follow him. What is he calling you to do? Obey him. You should trust him because Jesus is the only thing that satisfies. He's the only thing that truly satisfies. You see, what this text points to about Jesus is that Jesus is the only thing that truly satisfies. We sinners all are seeking life and satisfaction in dead things. There's this illustration of, of what sin is in the book of Jeremiah that I think just really, really captures how futile, how useless it is. It's Jeremiah 2, 13. This is God speaking to his people. He says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. See, a cistern is a, is a reservoir. It's like a container in, that you set into the ground that captures water. So when it rains, the cistern will fill, and you'll have this reserve, this safe amount of water to use just in case. It's not as good as a well. A well gives fresh water from underground. It's definitely not as good as a river or a spring, which have running water flowing through it. It's kind of the, the worst type of water outside of, uh, outside of nothing, I guess, or, or pond water, I don't know. But if a cistern is broken, then no matter how much water you pour into it, it will always just drain out the bottom right? If a cistern is broken, it can hold no water. And so this picture of sin here from this verse in Jeremiah is that the people of God forsook, they turned away from the God who provides life, the fountain of living water, and instead they made cisterns that were broken and could hold no water. And that's what we do with our sin. When we sin, we turn away from the God who gives life and instead seek life in these lesser things that could never provide it. When we think that wealth or relationships or fame or entertainment or the American dream will satisfy our souls, we're trying to drink from broken cisterns. You see, no matter how much stuff you have, no matter how many people think you're neat, we'll always crave 
more. At the pinnacle of human success, we often realize that it's not enough. Back in 2005, after Tom Brady won his third Super Bowl, he, he gave an interview on 60 Minutes, and he was asked about how he felt about having won this third Super Bowl as a 27-year-old. As a he gave this response. He says, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is. I reached my goals, my dream, my life. Me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27, and what else is there for me? Right, whether or not you're fans of the Patriots, which I'm not. Uh, Tom Brady is, is impressive, right? He's one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, and at 27, he had done three times what so many people dream of doing once and never do. And yet, it wasn't enough. It didn't satisfy. And if three Super Bowl rings weren't enough for him, my guess is that six haven't satisfied him either. You see, we never find life outside of Jesus. The pinnacles of human success turn out to be meaningless if you don't have Christ. That's the situation we find ourselves in when we choose these things that are less than God and try and make them God. They do not satisfy and we're left wanting. We are so prone to seek sinful satisfaction in the things of the world and we're left wanting. But God had mercy. You see, God's seen our suffering, seen us chase after these broken cisterns that can't give life, he sent his son to be our provision. He sent Jesus to be the bread of life. When this same story is taught in the Gospel of John, there's this discourse that happens between Jesus and, and the crowd on the next day. See, the crowd tracks Jesus down because they want more bread. They want another miracle. And he tells them that they should instead work for the food that does not perish, but that endures to eternal life. And so they bring up the story of the manna from heaven that I talked about earlier. They bring up the, the bread from heaven that they received, and Jesus says this in John 6, verses 32 to 35. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is the bread of life that satisfies your soul. If you come to him and you find life in him, you will be satisfied. See, Jesus bore the wrath for our sin so that we could be reconciled to God through faith. These, these things we're looking, these things that we look to for life, wealth, family, fame, all of these, these lesser things that may be good but aren't God, when we look to them, what we're truly looking for is that relationship with God, is reconciliation with him. Reconciliation means being reconnected to the God who satisfies our deepest longing. And we live in a world full of wonderful blessings that point to God, but none of them can replace God. You see, only through the reconciliation that comes from faith in Jesus can we be satisfied and find real rest. And so Jesus, so God sent Jesus to earth to be born as a human, to take upon himself our sins, our shortcomings, our failures, so that we could be restored to relationship with God, that if we place our faith in him, we can be reconciled to him and find true satisfaction. Faction. This is the only hope to be satisfied in life. Because when we place the weight of godhood on lesser things, when we try and make a marriage or a family or a career God, it warps, it breaks, it becomes twisted. 
How many marriages have ended because someone thought their spouse was supposed to be their savior? How many parents have chased off their children because they forced them to carry all their hopes and all their dreams? How many careers have become slavery because someone thought they could provide real satisfaction? The only thing that will satisfy is knowing Jesus. And this is what's symbolized in communion. You know, one of the really cool things about this passage is that it subtly points forward to communion, to the Lord's Supper instituted later in this gospel. The same verbs are used throughout this story that are used in the institution of the Lord's Supper. Jesus taking the bread, blessing it, breaking it, giving it to his followers. See, what's being pointed to, what's being revealed is that while bread will satisfy for a while, Jesus satisfies forever. We don't just need bread. We need the bread from heaven. We need the bread of life, Jesus, to come into our lives and satisfy our longing. Jesus is what satisfies. And in communion, we are reminded of the price he paid so that we could have life. So what should you do with this information? How do you respond? First, I would say turn from broken cisterns. Stop looking for life in things that will never provide life. Stop looking for salvation from lesser things. For some of you, that might mean repenting of your sin, taking that first step of faith, repenting of your sin, saying that you are a sinner, that you cannot save yourself, and trusting through faith in the sacrifice of Christ for, for life. For many of us as believers, that's, that means to stop looking for salvation from lesser things. Don't make good things like family or comfort or, or money or work. Don't make them gods. Don't turn to wicked things for refuge when you're stressed or afraid. Instead, look to Jesus. So turn from broken cisterns and be satisfied in Christ, the bread of life broken for you. You see, we have this incredible gift in Jesus. We have life. A lot of times a, a pastor will make the point of his sermon, read your Bible more. And I don't, I don't want to do that. I want, I want you guys to hear me say, read your Bible better. Right? I'm never going to tell you not to read your Bible, or I'm never going to say you're reading it too much. But I think that if we look at God's Word just as a to-do list, just as a, a checkbox on the path to righteousness, then we'll never find life in it. But if we look and we actually see the character of God like we saw in this story, we actually see the provision of God like we saw in this story, then we can actually find life in it. So be satisfied in Christ. Seek for him in his word. Come to him in prayer. Celebrate him in the community of the saints. Do the things that Christians do, not because you're trying to prove yourself a Christian, but because in them and through them you find life in Jesus. Be satisfied in Christ, the bread of life broken for you.